Chapter Four: Cost and Benefit. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Matthew sixteen twenty four through twenty six. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, "This man began to build and was not able to finish." Luke fourteen twenty eight through thirty. We come now to the other side of the cost benefit analysis. If God has so arranged things that following Jesus is not possible without the full surrender of everything we have, what is it about the kingdom life that renders it worth such a sacrifice? God is not cruel to His children, so He would never make things harder than necessary. Nor is He a bad economist, as if He would ask them to make a bad investment. No one has a greater interest in the happiness and well-being of a child than does a loving parent. A father sees further ahead and understands the true road to happiness and satisfaction far better than does the nearsighted child, who often disdains nothing so much as delayed gratification. If the kingdom did not hold the greatest prospects of well-being, happiness, and satisfaction for his children, God would never have urged us to make the sacrifices necessary to have a place in it. We are asked to trust His wisdom and goodness in this matter. So, what is it about kingdom citizenship or discipleship that has held such appeal to the millions of clear-sighted individuals who, throughout history, have chosen to meet the price? The value of the kingdom of God to the disciple. The benefits of discipleship are many. However, they are not such things as can be appreciated by someone still mesmerized by the shiny baubles that the world displays to distract or lure its foolish captives away from that which the world simply cannot offer at any price. Let's see what Jesus Himself said would be the rewards of complete surrender to Him as Lord and King. I have an idea what I have to give up. What does Christ offer in their place? One, to be with Him. There is a major assumption throughout the Bible that may not always be prominent in the thinking of religious people, many of whom have merely seen in religion primarily a means to some self-serving end. The biblical assumption is that God is eminently capable of being valued and loved for who He is, quite apart from any prospect of our receiving anything from Him. That is one of the primary lessons of the Book of Job. Satan was betting that this assumption is not true. Job was the guinea pig. Satan lost the bet. Many who identify as Christians seem not to have really processed this fact. The question, "What shall I have in exchange for serving God?" is answered very simply: You will have God. If this cannot be seen as the one reward above all others worth having, then one's readiness to become a disciple of the King should not be assumed. A true lover gladly sacrifices all, and will even die for the beloved. Those who truly love God require nothing more than the knowledge that He is blessed by our actions. Such a one desires nothing so much as to enjoy Him. This is what love is. Many believers are frustrated that they seem to love God so little, but do not know what can be done to redress this deficiency. I have two suggestions for such people. A. In most cases of such a malady, wholehearted love for God is being crowded out of the heart by the presence of love for His rivals, things, pleasures, people, popularity, ambition, etc. In so far as a woman loves multiple men or even one man besides her husband, she will have a diminished capacity for loving her husband supremely and will entirely fail to love him exclusively. There may be some affection or appreciation toward him, but if he is not the sole object of her devotion, she can never love him as she ought. One cannot have two supreme loves. This is why God was so intolerant of idolatry. None of the pagan gods required the love of their sycophants. For a worshipper of any pagan deity to spread his or her devotion among multiple idols was no problem. None of the demonic images objected because they had no love for, nor expected any love from, their adherents. This is one consequence, I suppose, of their non-existence. Yahweh is not like them. He is the only God who desires the love of His followers because He is love.
All other things were created by him for our enjoyment, but not for our devotion. Everything that is not God himself must be enjoyed only as gifts from the one who gives them. Giving God his proper place is a choice that can be made, but it will be at the cost of all things that rival him as objects of devotion. Those persons, places, and things that we love have something about them that makes them attractive to us. Every one of these attractive features, however, is a gift from God, who possesses all of these elements in infinitude. Do you admire others for their beauty, their wit, their creativity, their intelligence, their strength, their musical ability, their generosity, their humility, their attentive care, their problem-solving ability, or any other virtue? Imagine people with whom you would enjoy spending a lot of time, and try to identify whatever it is that they possess that captivates you. That thing that you identify in them is possessed by God to an infinite degree. He is the source of it in them. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights. God is the infinite possessor and fountainhead of all desirable traits. Are you impressed by great works of art? by musical compositions, by wonderful stories, by delectable foods, by delightful climates and vistas? These are but a pinch of God's store of wonders that proceed from his glory and magnificence. He is the artist, and these are but a token of what he has in store for those who love him. Those who settle for anything less than God are settling for crumbs from his table. As St. Teresa of Avila wrote, Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone suffices. One who was probably the wealthiest king of his time, who lacked nothing that the ancient world could provide to the rich and powerful, found one thing only that could permanently fascinate and enthrall him. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. This mirrors Mary of Bethany's obsession with Jesus himself, sitting at his feet and hearing his voice. Jesus said that Mary had chosen the one thing needed. Notice, this was a choice Mary had made over other possible options. She had discovered the one thing that is needed by every human soul. B. Another way in which greater love can be cultivated is by increasing one's gratitude factor. Few things interfere with feelings of love so much as does a sense of entitlement. This is an especially ugly aspect of pride or arrogance. In truth, few people owe us anything at all, and we have made enough mistakes and done enough harm to others, for which we have not suffered as we deserve to have, to put us in the negative side of the ledger of indebtedness. Despite any injustices we have suffered from others, on balance, we have all received much better than we can honestly claim to deserve. When we humble ourselves to realize that we are not uniquely important people and that the world does not owe us any favors, we can become grateful people. Spoiled children are incapable of feeling gratitude, since every favor they have enjoyed as a result of the generosity of others is perceived as something owed to them. However, when we bring our self-image into sync with reality, we must realize that every kindness, every mercy, every gift we have received has been undeserved and has been provided by persons who made sacrifices for us when they actually owed us nothing. This is the basis of being grateful people and is one of the greatest secrets of happiness. What do we imagine that God owes us? Certainly nothing other than condemnation for our rebellion against him. Yet, he withholds his hand of discipline unaccountably long, and still brings into our lives, along with correction, pure mercy and generosity. The kindness of others is a gift from him. Any modicum of health and pleasure that any of us enjoys comes from his hand. Even the offer of forgiveness and of ultimately living and reigning with him is outrageously unwarranted by anything we have earned. Ingratitude to God is a sin, but gratitude makes the heart appreciative. If cultivated, gratitude is a seedbed from which love for him will grow. Before we allow a complaint to take root in our minds, we should instruct our hearts. Think of all the undeserved benefits I have received, many of which have been withheld from people much better than myself. It is almost miraculous how such a habit will improve one's life and please God. David said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Then he proceeded to enumerate a dozen or more blessings he had received. 
Very few habits of mind are calculated to increase one's appreciation and love for God more than this. We love Him because He first loved us. It is hard for emotional love to be absent where there is adequate gratitude. It is in the nature of agape love, and even of romantic love, which is not the same thing but bears some resemblance to it, that the lover takes great pleasure in the very presence of the beloved. This is true whether one is thinking of a spouse, one's own child, a personal hero, or Jesus. To know that that person wants to be with you and is pleased in you rivals all other pleasures. To know that one has pleased God and that Jesus is delighted is greater than any worldly satisfaction available. To those who love God, His presence and His pleasure become the ultimate reward. It is like the child whose father takes time out of his day to go and watch his track meet, or her musical recital, or even just to sit on the shore fishing with the child. To hear one's father say, You did excellently, does more to build the child's character and confidence than could a cabinet full of shiny trophies. What pleasure could be desired above that of having God say, I want to hang out with you and watch how you run in the race, or let's go fishing together for men. Nothing this world can offer can reasonably bring so much delight as to hear God say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Though this statement will be followed by the bestowing of other rewards, the words themselves count more than any additional trophies that may follow. God is most pleased with those who value His presence above all else. Those who do not desire Him need to double-check and see if they know exactly who it is we are talking about here. The greatest benefit to the disciples of Jesus, the great reward of their sacrifices, is His presence with them. Those who actually know Him are aware of this. Though Jesus often needed a respite from the crowds, the disciples were always permitted to accompany Him. But Jesus withdrew with His disciples to the sea. It is to them that He promised, I am with you always. He said, Follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Having Jesus is the greatest reward for following Jesus. As Francis Chan put it, Either people will be awed by the sacred, or they will not. If the sacred is not enough, then it is clear that the Spirit has not done a work in their lives. If the sheep don't hear his voice, let them walk away. Unquote. Francis Chan, Letters to the Church, 2018. 2. To be taught by him. Jesus puts out a general welcome to all who wish to come to him, urging, Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. To be under the yoke is to be under servitude and under instruction. It is the privilege of disciples to be under servitude and the instruction of Christ. The disciple is a learner directly under Christ. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. One who is taught by Christ may also learn from men and women who are his instruments, but none but Christ must be regarded as the ultimate teacher. For one is your teacher, the Christ. It is the Spirit of Christ, the anointing, who leads into all truth. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. Learning directly from the Spirit of Jesus is the disciple's privilege, but one must recognize that the Holy Spirit also gives gifts, including teachers to the church. Human teachers, through whom the Spirit teaches, as well as personal inward guidance and instruction, are equally means by which Christ teaches His disciples. Not everyone who teaches is necessarily anointed as a vessel through whom the Spirit genuinely speaks. Every thought communicated to us by others is subject to review, criticism, and possible rejection by Christ's Spirit within the true disciple. 3. To be set free. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The very definition of discipleship is remaining within the realm of his instruction, believing and following what he teaches. It may seem ironic that the servitude of Christ's yoke is actually the path of greatest liberty. How can this be? The New Testament assumes that true disciples have been given a new heart inclined toward obedience, and possessing no greater desire than to please God in all things. Many religious people, like the Pharisees, had a desire to keep God's commandments— but they found, as Paul testifies autobiographically, that they could not live as they knew they should because of the bondage of the flesh to sin.
When Jesus told the Jews that by becoming disciples they could become free, the hearers arrogantly objected. To whom were they in bondage that they should require him to liberate them? This was a really strange question for them to ask, since their liberation from the Romans was precisely what they were waiting for the Messiah to accomplish. However, Jesus did not seem to them like a man with any aspirations of running off the Romans. So from whom could he promise to free them? Jesus told them that they were slaves of sin and needed to be set free. This liberation would occur in the course of their continuing in his words as his disciples. This is precisely how the angel had summarized Jesus' mission when addressing Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Those who are Christ's followers receive the assistance of his word, which is alive and powerful, and of the Holy Spirit to reshape the course of their lives through submission to the truth. Sin dominates to a very large degree through ignorance and deception. Whoever chooses to sin is succumbing at that moment to a delusion. He or she is thinking that sinning will satisfy and impart happiness, that there will be few or no adverse consequences for the action, or at least that the pleasure of sin will outweigh the damage that may result from it. Not one of these beliefs is true. Satan is the deceiver. And it is precisely by such deception that he keeps us involved like prisoners in sinful behaviors, even when we want to shake them off. Only the power of God liberates people from sinful bondage, and this power is a major benefit of following Christ. I have known hundreds of people who have testified to having obtained freedom from addictions and self-destructive habits to which they were in bondage. They were freed by surrendering to Christ and entering the kingdom of God. Paul wrote to the Corinthians about their scandalous, sinful bondages from which they were delivered. He said that those in such bondage will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. However, in the next verse, he speaks of their having been delivered from such lifestyles, so that they now could participate in the kingdom life. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Being a slave of sin may provide momentary fun to those whose threshold for enjoyment is low, but the difference between fun and happiness is a wide chasm. No one who knows the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, which is how Paul describes life in the kingdom of God, could ever be satisfied to be reduced to the highest highs experienced by those living in their sins. Once one has truly tasted the kingdom, it spoils him or her for the tawdry pleasures of the world. Those who never find freedom from their sins and addictions eventually come to ruin and grief, both in this life and in the next. Deliverance is only found in following Christ. 4. The Blessings of the Beatitudes Jesus' famous discourse to his disciples on the mountainside opened with a series of statements called Beatitudes. Jesus gave special promises that apply to the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the persecuted. These were words he used to describe his followers. Footnote Twice as many Beatitudes are found in Matthew 5, verses 3 to 10. End footnote. He began his message, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. To describe someone as blessed means that he or she is fortunate, enviable, and in truly happy circumstances. The phrase, blessed are, could be paraphrased, how blissful. Jesus' list of the circumstances that render a person blissful or enviable seems counterintuitive to the natural hearer. Perhaps this is why Jesus had to state such things explicitly, since we would never have guessed them. Do we believe him? Or is this an area where we are content to live as if we know more than the Son of God knows about real life? 
Jesus was aware that his words would cut across the grain of natural human thinking. That may be why he justified each statement by mentioning his rationale. Why are these poor men blessed? Because they possess the kingdom of God. Why are these hungry, weeping, persecuted ones enviable? Because they have the guarantee, not given to others, that they will be satisfied and will have the last laugh. The similar but fuller list of Beatitudes found in Matthew 5, verses 3 to 10, adds to this list blessings to the poor in spirit, humble, the meek, the pure in heart, those hungering for righteousness, and the peacemakers, all of which are intended to designate true disciples. He promised that they will be vindicated, will inherit the earth, will see God, and will be known as God's children. This is quite a catalog of benefits promised to those who choose the way of the disciple. The world cannot promise half so much. 5. To accomplish things of eternal value. Anyone who becomes contemplative about the purpose of life must at some point ask the questions, What impact have I made upon the world and the well-being of my fellow man? And, When I am gone, will it make any difference at all that I was here? Will anything remain improved eternally, or even ten minutes after my brief life has ended? It is such concerns as these that inspire many people to become philanthropists, social workers, soldiers, political activists, Peace Corps volunteers, etc. I am sure that all of these activities have the potential of making one feel better about having lived than would be the case if one merely pursued an empty course of selfish pleasure and luxury. However, those who change circumstances for the better in their world still have to come to grips with the fact that few of these things impact anything in the long run. The gains made in one generation can easily be lost in the succeeding generation, or even in one's own lifetime, so that all of our efforts can easily come to nothing. There is great wisdom distilled in the old, well-worn adage, Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Footnote. This is the refrain in a classic poem by missionary C.T. Studd, entitled, Only One Life. End footnote. All accomplishments that do not promote the eternal reign of Christ in the world and in the hearts of people, even if their benefits linger for generations, can and will someday disappear and be gone forever. Percy Bysshe Shelley's profound poem about Ozymandias, the Greek name for Egyptian Pharaoh Ramses II, cynically underscores the vain and temporary nature of even the greatest accomplishments of men. The poem describes the ruins of a monument discovered in the Egyptian desert. It had once been an intact statue of the great Ramses II, erected in the height of his power and prestige. All that remained in modern times were two trunkless legs, and near them lay half-sunk a shattered visage, with wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. On the pedestal under the truncated legs there is an inscription, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. All around this wrecked monument are level sands as far as the eye can see. Footnote. Percy Bysshe Shelley, Ozymandias, in Miscellaneous and Posthumous Poems of Percy Bysshe Shelley. End footnote. Very well might the mighty despair who encounter this dilapidated monument, but not for reasons such as the tyrant had imagined. Viewing the inscription, one might indeed despair of the lasting impact of one's own accomplishments in view of the precedent of Ozymandias, like hundreds of powerful rulers before and after him, whose works have entirely disappeared in the sands of time. The greatest rulers of ancient times come to nothing, and are mostly or entirely forgotten. If their remarkable accomplishments disappear below the dunes, what might any of us expect concerning the long-term significance of our own meager contributions to the history of the world? What can possibly give life transcendent purpose and give us the ability to impact eternity for the better? The answer, and the only one, is found in the kingdom of God, as the prophet foretold and history has vindicated. Of the increase of the Messiah's government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Only the disciples of Jesus Christ, deployed in the building and expansion of this kingdom of eternal justice, can know with certainty that their labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
the kingdom moves forward by slow and steady progress through the combined small contributions of every disciple with boots on the ground. The progress made and the souls impacted have eternal value and significance. All other human accomplishments of any kind come to nothing soon enough. This is the privilege of discipleship. The ability to be employed in the Messiah's work and to impact the world eternally for the better. 6. To Glorify God Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Though generally underappreciated, the glory of God is the greatest incentive for making whatever sacrifices may be necessary in living as a disciple. Obedient disciples bear the fruit of the kingdom, and this is what glorifies God. Only those who have been reborn by the inner working of God can really even care much about this matter of glorifying God, though to the true disciple, this is all that matters. There is a general complaint among the ignorant that God always seems to be concerned only about his own reputation. Why does God always want people to praise and glorify him? Doesn't this suggest that he has an enormous ego requiring continual strokes from his creatures? Even if God really is great, doesn't it kind of spoil it if he is always saying, Appreciate me! and glorify me! Those who make this complaint cannot understand God's motivations as those who know him do. Nor probably do they know their own motives for objecting to this. Usually the complainers resent God's requirement that we honor him only because this competes with their own needy craving to be respected and honored by others. In fact, it is this very flaw in themselves that makes it necessary for God to remind us so often that he is the one to be glorified. God is not arrogant. The Bible describes him as one who humbles himself even to observe us. We who would have zero significance if not for his choosing to take notice of us. David found it inconceivable that God would impute any value to such specks of dust as ourselves. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? It should first be acknowledged that God has absolutely no need for our praise, nor for us to glorify him. The angels do that much better than we do anyway, and there were already millions of them before God created humankind. Our praise of him contributes nothing to his ego, any more than a three-year-old puffs up a grown man who has broken free a stubborn jar lid by saying, Wow, you are really strong! The vast differential between the one praising and the one praised renders the child's words inconsequential to the self-esteem of the man. So why would God's word so frequently prod us to give him his due honor and glory? Let me attempt to clarify in steps. God is infinitely superior to the sum total of all he created, especially such specks of dust as ourselves. He created humans to know him, to be in a relationship with him, and in some sense to be like him. Humans have chosen to think they are better and wiser than God, and have thus not only failed to know him accurately, but have put themselves completely out of sync with the order of the universe, which itself continually glorifies him. Psalm 19, verse 1. Unlike the animals, humans are worshippers by nature, and will inevitably worship something. Those who do not worship God inevitably put inferior objects of worship in his place, whether self, other humans, objects, money, habits that bring momentary pleasure, etc. Our tendency toward worship will lead us to honor and serve that which most impresses us. Yet, compared to God, nothing is really impressive at all. To fail to recognize and acknowledge God's superiority will doom us to the mistaken notion that lesser things are worthy of our esteem and devotion. All things worshipped apart from God himself are portals to the worship of demons and bring us into slavery to demonic powers. Since the truth sets us free from delusions that trap and eventually kill us, our only hope of liberation is to acknowledge the truth, recognizing the magnificence and incomparable superiority of God above all things, especially ourselves. When we glorify God as we should, we are doing nothing to his advantage, but we are doing something that benefits us immensely. We are recalibrating our own instincts writing our overall orientation, coming back into sync with the truth and universal reality, 
whereby we discover our true place of freedom and value as children of God. This cannot occur while we are misapprehending God and thinking lower thoughts of Him than comport with reality. 7. To become like Him There is another totally unselfish motive in God that causes Him to call us into His proper worship, and that is that although He cannot make Himself inglorious in order to relate with us, He can make us more glorious, more like Himself, in order that we can relate with Him. What does it look like to share in His glory? It looks like Jesus. Our glorification is our transformation into His image and comes about by our fixing our gaze on His glory. According to Paul, We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Even such a good servant as Moses was told that he could not look upon God's glory and survive the intensity of that radiance. By contrast, God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God has called the disciples of Jesus not only to behold his glory, but to be sharers in it. That is, to be like Jesus, as it is written, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. This is the most astonishing of the benefits received by the faithful disciples of Jesus, namely, to be like him. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. There are those who are not attracted to Jesus. This was true in his own day as well. There's no accounting for taste. However, those who have known and loved him can imagine no greater reward than to share with him eternally in his glorious nature and radiant purity. The purpose of existence lies before us, and the disciple of Jesus is one who recognizes and seizes it. Many find themselves upon their deathbeds wondering why they even lived, and what, if anything, they have accomplished of value. Too often, in one's dying hours or days, there is little more than bitter regrets over wasted opportunities. The man or woman who has lived a life devoted to following and serving Christ will never have occasion to regret this choice. In my experience, the only regret I have heard expressed by true disciples at the end of life is that they had not made their commitment to Christ earlier and thereby made a greater eternal impact for him and for his kingdom during this brief lifetime.